Okay, so today we're going to start talking about frictional forces. So let's imagine that we have a block, and that block has some weight, um, which we represent as a force of gravity being applied to its centroid, and it's sitting on some surface. If we were to draw the free body diagram of that block, it would look something like this, right? We would have that force. It has to be withstood by this force, and it turns out that where is this responsive force or reaction force coming from? It's actually distributed all along the bottom. Everywhere the block is making contact with the surface, molecules are pushing back, okay? So this is so far. What about a case where we again have a block? That block is sitting again on the same surface, but now we pull on the block. So we have, let's see, the weight and we have some P force that we're pulling on the block. Now let's draw our free body diagram. So here we have W, here we have P, and we know that there has to be some force pushing back up to withstand W, but if we were to say pick an arbitrary point right there, right? We would notice that P and W make a moment around this point. That means I can't apply that force right in the center as I did over here. I have to apply it over here to counteract the actual moment. What that means is that as we increase P, as we go from 0P to some higher values of P, the shape of this, this uh, distributed load changes and becomes more trapezoidal, okay? And that effect gets more and more and more pronounced as P gets larger and larger and larger, and what happens is that this um, reactive force here moves. Its location moves. It moves from the center, just below W, all the way over to this corner. Once it's reached the corner, it can't move any further, but P could still increase. What does that mean? That means that the block would tip over. And so there's some problems in this chapter. We're talking about what is the minimum force P before the block begins to tip. The other thing that we should recognize, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase these forces I have down here to make it a little clearer. Uh-oh, wrong way. is we have to have a force that counteracts P. That force has to push in this direction, right? It has to push from right to left. The question is, how is that force distributed? Now, that force creates no moment around any points that are on this bottom surface. So there we're not really having a problem, right? The question is, where does that force come from? That force is actually the friction force. And if you remember from physics, friction is mu times n. So if I have a distribution that's weighted towards the right of n, my distribution in my friction forces has to be weighted towards the right. So what that might look like is large friction forces here, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller friction forces here. Overall, however, we would have a single friction force that we could draw, and we would say that it's being applied somewhere here, and we would call that the force F, the force of friction. So now let's go back. So now we have the normal force, which comes about from W, and this frictional force, which is the force that withstands or pushes against or resists the motion that would be caused by the pulling force P. And it turns out that those two forces are related when block is just about to move. So let's think about this again. Let's imagine that I have a graph, and on this axis we're going to plot the value of P, and on this axis we're going to plot the value of FS. Okay, so that's the friction force that resists P. Now, 
Initially, there's no frictional force, there's no P. I increase P just a little bit, the friction force has to increase exactly the same amount to withstand the motion. Increase P again has to increase by exactly the same amount to withstand the motion, and that process continues. However, at some point, we all know that we'll be able to pull hard enough to cause the block to slide. That means that the friction force suddenly doesn't increase anymore. And so P increases, but the friction force does not increase. This distance, or this frictional force, is equivalent to mu static friction times the normal force. So the only place you get to apply this equation is when the block is just about to move. In other words, if the block has, has if you're applying a force far below the force that would cause a block to move, this equation is not valid. Okay? So there's a couple points we need to make about this. Point number one is that F or FS acts parallel to surface while N acts perpendicular to the surface. The second point is that FS is independent contact independent of uh, contact area assuming n small enough curse n is small enough that deformation does not occur and all the problems that we'll be working we can check that off that's always going to happen the third thing we should point out is that we have two types of friction coefficient. So there's mu s, which is static, oops, static friction, and there's mu k, which is kinetic friction. Since mu s is always just a little bit greater than mu k, what that means is that when slipping is about to occur, Fs equals mu s in. Okay, a couple of points about direction. So Typically, when we draw a free body diagram and when we get equations of equilibrium, the sign of un whoops, known forces can be assumed. Okay? Not true for FS. Okay? The reason is that FS equals mu S in is a scalar equation. It comes about um, it, there's no sign information included. So that means that you, when you draw a free body diagram, with FS must draw FS opposing motion. Okay? So I wrote this even though I was saying it because this is very important. This is a problem that a lot of students have. 
we've demonstrated over and over again that when you draw a free body diagram and you have unknown forces and you're just going to use equations of equilibrium to solve it, that you can just assume a direction in the equations of equilibrium or assume a direction in the free body diagram for that unknown force and then the sign will work out for you. Okay. Now, we sometimes use information such as ropes can only pull, for example, um, to help us make an educated guess, but nonetheless, we could have guessed wrong and the sign would have told us that we guessed wrong. Okay? That is not true when we're dealing with frictional forces. Okay? When you draw the free body diagram, you must draw the direction of Fs in the direction that opposes the motion of the object on which Fs is acting. Okay? There are three types of three types of problems. The first type is nothing nothing is close to slipping. All right, this is exactly what we've done before. Exactly what we've done so far in this class. And in fact, when we work these problems, we are not using, do not use, fs equals mu n. And since we're not going to use fs equals mu n, we can assume a direction of fs if we want to. Okay? The second type of problem is everything. Everything moves. Okay, so we might imagine that as this type of problem. So I've got a house at the wall and I've got a ladder beside it. So if the ladder starts to slide, then it slides up here at this point. It also slides down here at this point. In other words, this point cannot move unless this point moves. So that's what we mean by everything moves. That means that Fs equals mu S in applies at all contact surfaces. All right, applies at all contact surfaces. There's another possibility, and this is the most difficult problem to work. Some Some contact surfaces are close to slipping, some are not. So let's imagine this situation. So let's say I had a ladder. It's connected up here by um, a hinge, and it's just sitting on the ground. So, um, and I pull right here on this ladder. So we'll ignore any of the cross braces. There are no cross braces in a situation. What could happen is that point A, in other words, this, this beam of the ladder, the ones that runs this way, tips up straighter, and point A, we have slipping in this direction. It could also be that nothing happens at point A, but at point B, it moves. So in this case, Fs equals mu s in at some but not all surfaces. And then the question becomes, well, which surface do I apply this equation to? And we'll see that what you have to do is make a guess and then keep working. And then when at the end, if you find out that you're, uh, uh, the end, you will find out that you've guessed correct 
or incorrectly. If you've guessed incorrectly, you'll have to go back and rework the problem. All right. So the book talks about this on uh, page 394 and gives a couple of other examples of um, these three cases. I realize this is kind of a long video. Um, I hope you've listened to it. I hope you will read the first two sections at least of the book before we get to uh, class on Monday. And on Monday I'll start working some problems.